My first job in film was working as a messenger for a post-production house. So I got fired for uh, splicing a very important print together uh, in the wrong order for a big screening. So I was driving a cab, and I kept looking for uh, jobs in the film business. I had uh, decided to make this little documentary film called Together. And we had started to shoot this 16 millimeter footage, and we needed to get it sunk up. We needed an assistant editor. And I kind of stepped into the gap, and Sean and I finished the film. Thus, we were very close friends at the end of it. And he was approached uh, by these same gentlemen, I think the company was Cinema 77, to uh, make a scary movie. To avoid painting, keep repeating to yourself. It's only a movie. I haven't, over a long career, maybe 30, 35 years, been able to totally differentiate where one's own inner self ends and one's reflection of the outer world begins, you know. And I'm probably angry coming out of fundamentalism. I'm, I have no doubts about that because it was very restrictive. I wasn't allowed to see films until I got out of college. I finally just. I started going once I was a young adult, but, uh, you know, grew up very rigidly, no dancing, no smoking, no car playing, uh, no movies. So I'm sure there was a certain amount of rage with that. It was the time of Vietnam. There was a tremendous amount of very, very shocking uh, footage coming out of Vietnam, especially to people that were anti-war, and I was, you know, I was. So I felt very angry and repulsed at the violence from there. And I also felt like American cinema did not show violence as, it, as I was seeing it in this footage, you know, which it was ugly and it was uh, sadistic and uh, there were sexual overtones and, um, and there was no good guys and bad guys. Wes and I went out to see um, one of the Man With No Name Clint Eastwood movies. That was like bang, bang, you're dead, but it really didn't have to do with, with people dying and, and, or any of the, of the real horror that would be attached to people dying. And we said, you know, if you could ever make a movie in which you thought somebody really died, it would be just dramatically different and strong. And it wouldn't have to be this big overproduced um, uh, numbing uh, of the sensibilities. I, I had always admired Virgin Springs, so I took that basic premise of a wealthy family, a father and mother living kind of in comfort and having a very middle class child. The daughter goes off with a sort of a very roughshod girl and are attacked by um, sort of rogue shepherds that are out in the woods and raped and then murdered. And then the shepherds uh, take shelter in the house of the parents because there's a storm and the parents in the middle of the night discover the bloody clothes of their daughter, realize what's happened and set about to murder all the shepherds. I always thought that was a fabulous bare bones story and a great sort of switching of how people that are peaceful be can become you know, violent and how the violent, sometimes you can start to feel a strange sympathy for them when you see that they're terrified and in way over their heads. So, sort of took that, and I think I wrote it in a long weekend on Long Island. The first, first indication I had that it was powerful was, in those days you had to have your scripts um, typed up by people on mimeograph machines. This gives you an idea how long ago it was. And we uh, had problems getting it back. And finally, uh, Sean went over there and said, what, what's taking you so long? And they said, we're so sorry, but everybody is like reading every page as it comes out of, off of the typist. And uh, this, is, this script is amazing. It's like horrified. And I kind of just had that sense that I've had a couple times in my career that this is something that people are going to talk about and it's going to have a huge impact. <laughs> So we sent it off to the boys in Boston. They really liked it, and they gave us a budget. I think Sean and I thought we could do it for $50,000. Sean's idea was that we could actually do it for 40. we We'd pocket the 10 and be rich, you know, 5,000 each. And instead, um, the producers there, or the, whoever you want to call them, they were really theater owners, mostly uh, outdoor theater owners, gave us $90,000. So we were just, you know, fat and sassy. Oh. 
Okay, yeah, sure, I'll tell you. Why not? I was an actor. I was a, a trained stage actor that just, the first time someone said to me, do you want to get laid in a movie and get paid? I said, whoa, yeah. <laughs> it sounds kind of strange, because at the time I was doing Broadway plays. But it just, it appealed to me, and I did it. I read for Sean for this movie, and someone else got the part. And he said to me, I'll call you later, which he did. He called me later for what is now called Last House on the Left. Uh, which was originally supposed to be a hardcore movie, but a disgusting hardcore movie. It was killing people and having sex with them. I mean, it was absolutely hideous. The, the script certainly was much more sexual. The rapes were much more explicit, and uh, the actors were committed to doing it. We were, we were basically out to break every barrier. I think the only other actress at the time we had was Lucy. Lucy came from X-rated movies, was doing all this stuff to get back at her dad. We said, there's no way we're going to do this. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to have a sex with fake blood. That's insane. And uh, it was interesting because at a certain point, the actors came to me and said, I think the story, we think the story is good enough not to have this explicit sexuality. And I thought about it. I said, OK, you're right. At the time, I was very much anti-violence. But I thought, what the hell, I'll make some money and <laughs> have some fun because it was friends. Uh, Lucy was my friend, the makeup girl was my friend, uh, Jeremy Rain and I were the best of friends. I got involved in Last House on the Left because of Fred, Perna Lincoln. And he sent me to Weston Sean, and they told me that I was too young and that the character was in her 40s, and I was 21 years old, and I said, but I can, I can be older, I can be anything. You know, when you're starving, you can be anything. And we needed people that were willing to do the script, which in some ways prevented, you know, any known actor from doing, coming anywhere close to it. I was in a play at the time, um, playing Susan Atkins, killing Sharon Tate every night off Broadway, and that's how I wound up getting this part, Sadie. So I kind of was doing killers and nurses. That was my entire career. And I guess the New York Times said I was a, a study in violence. So I don't know, somewhere within me, there's clearly someone who can play that. These girls uh, you know, want to buy some grass. Come on in. It was pretty much straight ahead casting, except we went in areas that probably a lot of casting people didn't go into. Uh, I, I won't go into too much detail because uh, I think certain things should be taken to one's grave. And I read a couple scenes, and then when they weren't looking, I looked through and saw a couple other scenes, and it said that I cut some woman's breast off and ate it. And I remember saying, I can't, I can't do that. And they told me not to pay attention to the script. They weren't going to use any of those things. I went downtown to Sean Cunningham's office, and they had this schleppy little office in the, I think it was in the 40s, on, right off of between 5th and 6th. went up there. Uh, the office was real, you know, like dusty and dirty, and they had a steam back on one side and chairs on the other. So I figured, you know, when you're an out-of-work actor in New York, uh, anyone willing to give you a job makes a good impression. <laughs> well, they offered Krug to me, and it was just an appointment, and I went up there, and I didn't want to chainsaw people. I wanted to do funny stuff. And I said, can I play the, sh the, mar the deputy? And they said, sure. <laughs> and I said, I have the guy who can do the music for you and could play Krug. And I said, let me go and come back. I'll bring you your Krug. I was told by my sister's boyfriend, Marty Cobb, that they were doing this film. And it was a horror film, and that I was dead on for the, you know, for the, um, for the lead role. They wanted a guy as big as I was, and he wasn't as big. 
What happened was that it was this hot day in the middle of August. And I brought back David. I outfitted him in five different sweaters, full regalia sweaters, threw down the arms, one so I could build him up and make him look huge. And my God, by the time we got past Central Park, I'm friggin' dying, man. All right. And I, I, I'm just, you know, I'm sweating. And I, so we got to 45th Street, and they were going to park the car. And I said, bullshit, you're parking the car. I jumped out of the car in the middle of the street and ran down the block because I'm dying here. And I run into the, you know, run up the stairs and run into the audition. And I say, all right, I'm here, God damn it. Now, what do you want me to do? David Hess is a lunatic. David, you're a lunatic. I'm David Hess. You asked me to come here. I mean, I, and I'm, I'm just carrying on like a friggin' fool. And he had this... Just incredible energy. He wanted to do this movie so badly. I said, wait a minute, just wait a minute, you know. So I'm sitting in the office and I'm waiting for about 10 minutes. And they come out and they say, well, you got the role. And I want you to blow your brains out. I think it was Wes that said, oh, by the way, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a musician. And he said, oh, yeah, I said, what do you do? I said, so I gave him my, my resume in terms of being a musician. So he looks at me and says, well, would you like to do the music? <laughs> oh, he's of the junior, Sadie and crew. Out for the day with the Collingwood brood. Out for the day for some fresh air and sun. Let's have some fun with those two lovely children. Then I'll come as soon as we're done. The building we both were uh, working in was uh, full of cinema verite uh, documentarian, Leacock Pennybaker who did uh, Monterey Pop and Don't Look Back, the Dylan biography. So um, that was kind of the style that we were used to. Wes wanted to, uh, to create a, a verite um, sense of, of reality, and he felt that if he shot it more like a, a newsreel, uh, that, that it would have a certain credibility and a plausibility that we wouldn't be able to get with a sort of a more slick Hollywood style. We uh, got basically a documentary crew uh, a cinematographer named Victor Hurwitz who had his own camera so we didn't have to rent a camera. And uh, I think we had a crew of maybe seven. We shot the New York scenes first, the city scenes, and then we moved up to Connecticut. So we spent a week in New York and I think four weeks in Connecticut. Oh, it was a terribly difficult shoot. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. I had never gone to film school, never read a book about making movies, knew nothing about screen direction, master shots, coverage, anything. When you're a young actor, and you're doing your first work, your first couple of jobs or whatever, there's no such thing as a bad shoot or a difficult shoot. The reason being, you have nothing uh, by which to judge it and everything is a brand new experience. The shoot in general, since it's the first movie I'd ever been in, it was easy. You know, when you want to know how much it costs to make this movie, this movie was done in Sean's backyard, you know. And what I remember is uh, uh, Mrs. Cunningham running around trying to figure out what her son was doing and why he had all of his friends over at her house with all this equipment. We didn't know what we didn't know. So consequently, nobody was there saying, you can't do that. We just had the time of our lives. We just, it was just wonderful. Your adrenaline's running, you know, at such, such a peak level that, no, I mean, you don't even have to eat. And we bonded on, on many different levels because to be able to work as a unit, you have to have some kind of a feeling for the other actors, and we were all you know, this was a first attempt. Why don't you just lay back and enjoy being inferior? Zoom off, you male chauvinist dog. Pig, Sam. What? Male chauvinist pig. Fred Lincoln and Jeremy Rain were the, the other two members of our gang. Fred, I believe, had done a bunch of uh, adult movies prior to this, so he had, Fred had more experience in front of a camera than any, any of us. Fred Lincoln became a, became a friend, a professional friend of the family. He was a very nice guy. He was a, a, a moderating influence. He was very calm, and he had this wonderful wry sense of humor. He was really, a, he was a, a very good guy to have around. Fred's a funny guy. I mean, I remember Fred only with good you know, good things. He's, he talks like this. I remember how perfect he's like, yeah, 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 David. David was, a, that was the first movie David had ever done. And we all used to sit together at night and figure out what we're gonna do the next day and we'd talk about it. I met David Hess and we're instant friends. Even though I, you know, I, I figured this was a brute, a, a brute of a human being. Hit him in the stomach with all your might. Stop it! 
Stop it. You're gonna kill someone if you're not careful. What the hell are you doing? Oh, shit. I thought Mark was like Woody Allen. I thought he was very funny. I actually thought he was gonna go on and be famous. And I thought David had incredible power, incredible um, anger, which comes across. And I thought that Fred was so funny as Weasel Podowski. You guys ain't cows, is ya? Little cows <laughs> looking for some grass? Huh? Let me hear you move. Come on. Come on. Move. <laughs> I don't really think there was any weak links in the acting. I, I thought everybody, I bought everybody in the movie. And some of them had very little experience. The actors involved created this perverse family unit that became part of Krug's company, as it were. I think Wes's intent was to create, uh, uh, like, the anti-family and uh, uh, to create, you know, put the structures in there, the, the kind of uh, uh, normal structures of a mother, father, and a child, and a relative, but then populate it with, uh, you know, bizarre, decadent, uh, murderous people. I think they all did a really brilliant, intuitive job of acting that. I, I never had a problem with the acting. I mean, that was easy to do. I was captain of my rugby team at that time. I had no problem with controlled violence. So I was able to bring that on, onto the screen. David Hess, laid back, don't belong in the same sentence. David has ne hasn't had a laid back moment in his entire life. <laughs> Piss your pants. You want me to talk about my childhood? My childhood was was one of being ignored. And what do you do when you left your own volition as a child? You develop fantasies. So that was one thing that I could do very quickly. I could fantasize anything in a, on a moment's notice. And that's essentially what I did with, uh, with Krug. It was organic. He's a pedal to the metal guy, and I love him. David is a big, strong guy. He was, you know, he was young and, and, uh, and full of himself. And... And I think his version of acting at the time was to try to be the character in the moment. No, I don't want you girls to worry. I mean, we just wanted some company, that's all. For instance, the rape scenes um, essentially said, I'm going to stage, we're going to shoot this three times. We're going to take it from beginning to end. And I'm going to put the camera in three different places, uh, just as if I were, had three documentarian uh, cameras at a real event around the set. He was very gruff, very threatening, he didn't talk to her much. And um, I think Sandra really was, was afraid of him and probably of, of Fred a bit too. She actually left the night before we were gonna shoot. And she was somebody that I knew from legitimate movies too. We had done things together. And I talked to her and talked to her, told her, Tony, a movie, nobody's gonna hurt you, but you wanna know something? She was afraid of, of me, she was afraid of, of David and she was afraid of Jeremy the whole time we were shooting. I'm sure they had a very, very bad time with it. And I didn't hang out with the girls. I never really got to know them. They probably hated me. And she really got into this fear thing because what you're seeing in her face is real fear. I live over there. I live across the street. Come on, please. I had one scene with her, uh, if you recall in the film, the scene where we're, we're sitting over the ledge. There's a ledge and there's water underneath it. And we had done like a, I don't know, more takes than I, I was getting really upset because, you know, I was hitting it all the time and, you know, she wasn't getting it. So I recall turning to Wes and saying, uh, uh, Shut, give me two minutes with her. And uh, what happened was I grabbed her and I put her head over the cliff. And I said, if you don't get it right the next time, I'm gonna throw you over here. And like Wes will shoot it and it'll be great footage and you'll get hurt and you know, they'll take call an ambulance and that'll be that. But you really need to do this because I will throw you over. And she got it on the next take. <laughs> Willow, do you have a girlfriend? Oh sure, I got lots of girlfriends just waiting to get me. I don't think you do. Well, you're right. And Lucy, on the other hand, was was totally open and she would go anywhere that the scene allowed, you know, allowed it to go. And, and consequently, she really was, you know, she was believable. The actors really got into it. And I'm not just saying in, you know, in the obvious, in the violence or in the sex, but for instance, Lucy said something um, to, uh, to the younger, more naive girl. Of, There's just you and me here. There's nobody else here, which was totally improvised right on the spot. And it was so moving, so touching. Just you and me here, nobody else. Wes was wonderful because when he saw something 
he let us go with it. So there was a lot of improv that developed throughout the uh, throughout the filming. Uh, as long as uh, we were we were within you know you know the camera and within the frame, we could pretty much do what we wanted. You know, I would emphasize that I knew very little about how to handle actors. I don't remember getting any direction from Wes. The one thing I did do, which I still do, is I would say that you haven't gone far enough. You know, you have to let more out. You have to be more courageous in just letting your emotions out. And he wanted that kind of, uh, you know, documentary, natural. He didn't, he didn't want a lot to, to, of the actors' movements to be structured. He gave us the characters, we worked on them, and kind of let us go. <coughs> Wes is a very smart guy. I mean, he's he's not, you know, where he is today is no accident. He's a very good storyteller and he's very smart. This is not just Wes's film. I mean, Sean had a tremendous input into the film. Don't be under any illusion. They played the perfect role of producer and director, which allowed the actors to play their roles perfectly. Sean was always there, except when he was out trying to find the cheapest food he could get. It was sort of like an extended Halloween where we're just running around doing stuff and hoping not, not to get caught. And nobody knew what to do. <laughs> I mean, they just they didn't know how to kill anybody they had. They had the mother fighting Jeremy and beating her up and taking her knife and killing her. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this is a, a, a doctor's wife. There's no way she's going to beat this street girl in a fight. I said, just, just let uh, Jeremy hit her, knock her into the bushes, and drop her knife. And then they had this pool on the property that was pitch black. I said, so if we run into the pool, uh, Jeremy could be running away, and she'd run right into the pool, and, and then... That pool hadn't been cleaned in years. It was so scummy and dirty. I had a blood packet in my shirt, and I also had a thing I had to bite in my mouth. And so as she slashes my throat, I'm supposed to smack